meeting today. If you are dialing in via telephone, the Google Meet has muted you. If you need to speak to the group, please press star six on your phone to unmute and mute. We kindly ask that only those who are speaking to the group unmute the device via Google Meet chat. For public comment, if you would like to provide a public comment, a conflict of interest must be on file. Please send an email to medicaidpharmacy at utah.gov. The attendees are not a member of the DUR board. Please enter your contact information into the Google Meet chat or send an email to medicaidpharmacy at utah.gov. Please view the chat on the right if needed. Please provide normative feedback after the meeting to help us improve our process moving forward. Thank you. And I will leave it to Dr. Cannon. Great. Uh... Good morning to everybody. Uh, we had some lovely rain last night at my place, so uh, <laughs> that's a scary thing. When rain in July is like the most exciting thing of the week. But uh, anyway, uh, happy to have everybody here. Uh, everyone should have received a copy of the previous minutes. Uh, so um, I'll ask if there's any comments or changes, modifications that need to be made to the minutes. All right, hearing, oh, Kumar. May I propose that we accept uh, a draft as proposed? So we have a motion to accept. We I'll second, second that. Neil, I have to see you out of the parking lot and on the- no, Thank you, thank you, I apologize for the delay. Good morning here. <laughs> no. Very good. Uh, Neil seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Hearing none opposed, minutes are approved. Uh, and I apologize. I forgot to pull up the agenda in front of me. So, Noon, I think we, we normally move on to housekeeping and the PNT. That's correct. Yes, Jen does have uh, some updated on the housekeeping item. Okay. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us for our meeting today. A couple housekeeping items I just wanted to announce uh, for some changes in the pharmacy program and for some updates for you. First of all, uh, we did launch our medication therapy management policy uh, on July 1st. So just a couple weeks ago now, our MTM policy did go live, which um, as I've reviewed with you earlier, allows Medicaid members to receive an MTM consult from a pharmacist. It needs to be face-to-face. -face. Um, they can have an initial encounter and up to three follow-up visits um, per year. Uh, qualified members could be um, children um, or their parents, of course, for qualifying children uh, or guardians or adults who have one chronic condition and at least are taking three chronic medicines. Um, pharmacists would be reimbursed by billing uh, one of four, three or four CPT codes that we've identified for face-to-face -face visits. All this policy and um, the operational aspects of it are all on our Medicaid pharmacy website. Um, one caveat, we've been trying to get the word out that pharmacists must be enrolled with Medicaid as a provider to actually um, submit a CPT code and um, bill for this service. So just wanted to let you know that's a caveat. We really want pharmacists to participate in this service um, and provide, provide MTM to qualifying members. We think it could be a great asset to them and improve their healthcare outcomes. So um, if you are in your field of practice or you are a pharmacist or working with pharmacists, we would encourage you to pass along the word or you yourself get enrolled. Um, okay, next update. There was an EUA, uh, emergency use authorization, um, around prescribing of Paxlovid. Um, and this is pharmacist prescribing of Paxlovid that was released, ooh, I don't know if it was last week now or two weeks ago. Um, but there was information released uh, regarding the specifics of this policy. First and foremost, it's a requirement that the pharmacist does evaluate um, the um, member or patient uh, for certain uh, conditions and go through the safety checks, look at laboratory assessment uh, prior to prescribing. So there are details outlined by which the pharmacist must conduct 
an assessment and evaluation on behalf of this member prior to prescribing the product. Um, we do intend to participate on behalf of Medicaid. A couple things that we need right now, first of all, again, it goes back to a pharmacist being enrolled as a Medicaid provider. Um, but the second piece that we don't have enough information on yet are the billable codes for this evaluation and management step. So um, we have several pharmacists on the team, um, Brian and Noon, I believe, as well as Stephanie, uh, Luis, perhaps, who did attend this call that CMS uh, gave on um, prescribing standards and how to implement this. I was on another call with CMS yesterday. They have not released guidance on which codes the pharmacist should bill in order to provide this service. Um, but it should be forthcoming. They said they will be working on that. So um, Medicaid will be a provider. Uh, 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 um, we will participate in this policy. In fact, we're required to. And we will enable pharmacists to prescribe Paxlovid. We are waiting for their guidance on how to conduct the evaluation and management and, and to have billable codes for that. Um, Third, uh, Dr. Hoffman, I hope you're in a place where you can share just a little bit, but I wanted to touch on the fact that uh, we did receive guidance out of our last legislative session to conduct um, an evaluation of psychotropic medicines to be used for mental health conditions. Um, Dr. Hoffman is a co-chair of this task force that is evaluating the use of four different psychotropic medicines. I'm also a pharmacist participant in that work. Um, and Dr. Hoffman, I don't know if you're at a place where you wanna share a little bit about this so our DUR board is aware of the work that we're doing. If not, I can certainly uh, step in and, and speak to it. I can briefly speak at a high level. Um, so we uh, began meeting as a task force after selecting um, the required demographics of the membership um, through a collaborative process and um, solicited um, seats, uh, interested individuals to participate uh, in May with our first meeting. We are preparing uh, and are required to present a report to the legislature uh, by October on our recommendations. And those recommendations span the full gamut of safety and efficacy to uh, logistics, provider education, provider credentialing. Uh, it, it's, it's not something that could feasibly be completed in the timeframe requested, and we'll be reporting on our progress to date in meeting the objectives of, of the legislation in October. Um, we have been conducting monthly meetings for 90 minutes, um, and Jen can speak perhaps to the um, uh, services being provided from the University of Utah's College of Pharmacy in terms of supporting our evidence review. Um, our subject matter experts have weighed in on the, the direction of the evidence review um, and, and it's moving forward very nicely and quickly. We just had a deliverable of an annotated bibliography um, in the last week that is over 80 pages of, of material for our subject matter experts to consume. We've established several uh, work groups targeting things like ethics and regulation, safety and efficacy, uh, indi prescribing indications, uh, and um, some more of the operational considerations. Um, certainly the state has had a, um, it has had some experience in bringing uh, schedule one medications to the general public in the uh, Center for Medical Cannabis and some experience in how to, to establish programs that um, begin to give access to things while the, the evidence base is evolving um, in a way that protects patients uh, and providers, uh, given the constraints of, of these being Schedule One medications. Um, we don't really have um, a clear sense as to um, what the recommendations will be by this October, other than that our, our emerging sense is that the evidence is, is not really ready for prime time. Uh, and um, we need more time um, before we would be comfortable making recommendations around um, programs and that this is going to be a, a, a several years long process. So 
uh, Jan, I don't know if you have anything additional to add, um, but that's just a brief overview of our process and, and progress to date. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. The thing I'll add is that it's it's of great importance to us uh, at the task force to really develop an evidence-based approach. And we really appreciate the work that the DRRC at the university, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, who perform our DUR uh, evaluations and our PNT write-ups, um, have done a really nice job pulling together um, you know, having a structured approach to developing this annotated bi bibliography and really evaluating the evidence from a very um, rigorous, you know, perspective. So, um, you know, we do have a next step on it, but I did just want to mention that we are partnering with uh, Lauren. Lauren Heath is the lead on this, and you all are familiar with Lauren. And it's just been great to work with them on this and and have their support through this work. So um, there will be more to come. I just thought it was it's out there. We have open and public meetings, which any of you are welcome to attend if you'd like to participate in that work um, and just join. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that that was, that was ongoing. A uh, couple other changes uh, I will just quickly announce is our, we've mentioned a little while ago, we had gone out for a pharmacy RFP for a new software system. This was about a year ago. We had year and a half ago or so we posted an RFP and we're looking at replacing our pharmacy system knowing that our system today is pretty antiquated. I think it's ooh, 15 or 20 years old. Uh, we are getting ready to, uh, at that time, we decided not to move ahead simply because of our MMIS replacement system, PRISM, which is going live on January of uh, this year. And the timeline of these two different systems going together and the work that it would take was um, not, it wasn't working out. So we are reposting our RFP with the hopes of getting in an updated system. Um, we know that our updated system will offer all kinds of benefits to us, uh, including much improved DUR oversight, both prospective and retrospective DUR work. So um, we will be posting that hopefully by the end of the month, our, all of our paperwork and everything is with our purchasing team. And many of the members of this team have worked really hard on getting that together. So I uh, wanted to let you know our implementation, um, our hopes would be for next July. So July 1, 2023 would be that. So we're really excited about what that could mean for our program and the improved functionality that we would get with that. The last announcement I wanted to make is that we have completed our recruitment for um, my replacement as pharmacy director, and we do have an announcement on who our next pharmacy director will be. Uh, our pharmacy director will be Lisa Angelos. Uh, Lisa is a pharmacist who had, as uh, prior to her time as a pharmacist, actually worked at the Drug Regimen Review Center. Um, so again, at the university's College of Pharmacy, DRRC, and supported Medicaid's work in that role many years ago. She went to pharmacy school, post-pharmacy school, has worked at Intermountain Healthcare for, I think, close to 10 years in their inpatient setting. Um, she has several clinical certifications, has managed a team of 25 plus individuals in that setting. For the past uh, couple of years, she's worked at Change Healthcare who is our pharmacy vendor now and served as our account manager with the Utah program. So our team knows her really well. Um, she knows our program really well. She's an excellent um, individual, excellent candidate for this role. We're really excited to have her join us. Her first day will be on August 15th. So uh, plan to have some changes with Aunt, uh, Lisa joining the team. I think you guys will all enjoy working with her and we're excited to have her start. So those are my updates. I can take any questions you have at this time. Um, if not, thanks for the opportunity to share some updates. Great, thank you. Uh, Ryan, do you have an update for us on PNT? I don't have anything new for PNT. Um, our next meeting will be in September and it'll be uh, sort of a smaller review of sedative hypnotics, sort of in conjunction with the work that's been done in this body. Great. Uh, then with that, we'll move on to kind of the main agenda topic here on insomnia and uh, the University of Utah and the DRRC. So uh, we'll turn the time over to them. 
Uh, one note, uh, I do have to leave early to get to another meeting and noon will pick up for me, uh, take you guys to the finish line. So uh, thank you everyone in advance of me leaving and we'll turn this over to the University of Utah now. Okay, I will take it away from here then. Uh, just give me one second to present the slides. Hopefully all of you can see those slides there. Um, good morning. Today I will be reviewing recent guideline recommendations for the management of chronic insomnia in adults and efficacy and safety of melatonin for insomnia based on information from systematic reviews. According to the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, third edition, insomnia is defined as trouble initiating and or maintaining sleep or premature awakening that results in daytime symptoms. To be diagnosed with insomnia, wakefulness should occur despite the intention to sleep, conditions of a suitable sleep environment, and adequate opportunity to sleep. Approximately 30 to 50% of the general population is affected with occasional short-term insomnia, whereas at least 5 to 10% of the general population has chronic insomnia. Chronic insomnia is persistent symptoms for at least three months that occur at least three times a week. Insomnia may occur independently or in association with other conditions. Consistent and adequate amounts of sleep is associated with adverse health consequences. The goals of insomnia management are to improve sleep, mitigate psychological or physical distress that results from the disorder and improve function. Non-pharmacologic therapies for the treatment of insomnia include cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia abbreviated CBTI, sleep restriction, brief behavioral therapy for insomnia, stimulus control, and sleep hygiene education. Drug classes with FDA-approved therapies for insomnia include Z drugs, benzodiazepines, orexin receptor antagonists, tricyclic antidepressant histamine receptor antagonists, and melatonin receptor agonists. The majority of hypnotics are classified as Schedule IV controlled substances due to the increased risk of physical dependence, tolerance, and abuse. The exceptions are doxepin and remelteon, which are non-controlled substances. FDA-approved insomnia indications are further categorized into insomnia subtypes of sleep onset or sleep maintenance. Additionally, the recommended dose for some agents varies by sex and or age. Over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements are available on the market to help manage sleep problems. Other prescription pharmacotherapies with sedating effects such as antipsychotics and antidepressants are sometimes used off-label for the treatment of insomnia, but generally they should not be used for insomnia unless the patient has the primary indicated condition for these agents. We reviewed adult insomnia treatment recommendations from six guidelines published within the past five years, four from the United States and two from Europe. All four U.S. guidelines targeted adults 18 years of age and older with chronic insomnia. Each guideline made recommendations for pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment, except the 2021 and 2017 guidelines by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, abbreviated AASM, which focus only on behavioral and psychological interventions or pharmacologic management, respectively. The two European-based guidelines are also intended for adults 18 years of age and older with chronic insomnia and contain pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic recommendations. All guidelines addressing behavioral and or psychological treatments recommend CBTI as first-line therapy in adults with chronic insomnia. The Veterans Affairs Department of Defense, or VADOD, guideline prefers CBTI over pharmacotherapy as first-line treatment and highlights the importance of CBTI in patients with psychiatric comorbidities. The 2021 AASM and 2019 VADOD guidelines suggest offering brief behavioral therapy for insomnia. Only AASM suggests stimulus control, sleep restriction therapy, and relaxation therapy as monotherapy. Guidelines tend to discourage the use of sleep hygiene as a singular approach. It is recommended to be used in combination with other treatment modalities. 
AASM recognizes that some patients may require hypnotics either alone or in combination with CBTI. Before initiation of a short course of pharmacotherapy, providers should consider a patient's response to prior treatments, the accessibility of CBTI, and the patient's preferences. Of importance, authors of the 2017 AASM guidelines state that a recommendation against use of an agent is not equivalent to an established lack of effectiveness. Instead, this tends to be due to insufficient evidence supporting the rationale in favor of the treatment. The strength of guideline recommendations for all pharmacologic agents is generally weak. Recommended pharmacologic options generally include the Z drugs, benzodiazepine, low dose doxepin, suvorexin, and remelcion. Current guidelines create FDA approval of the newer orexin receptor antagonists, daridorexin and limborexin, thus no recommendations are provided for these agents. The, 27, or the 2016 ACP guideline does not provide drug-specific recommendations, but instead provides generalized clinical considerations and, and recommends that a shared decision-making approach considering benefits, harms, and costs of short-term use of medications be employed when deciding to add pharmacologic therapy. U.S. guidelines recommend against the use of over-the-counter dietary supplements, including melatonin, sleep aids, or antihistamines, due to inadequate supportive evidence and or safety concerns. The VA, DOD, and AASM both weekly recommend against the use of melatonin. However, the European BAP guideline recommends extended release melatonin as a first line pharmacologic option after a trial of CBTI for older adults with chronic insomnia due to the favorable side effect profile and modest efficacy in sleep quality and onset. This recommendation may in part be due to a prescription grade formulation of melatonin being available in Europe for the treatment of chronic insomnia in adults 55 years of age and older. The 20 2017 ESRS guideline weekly recommends against the use of melatonin. Due to the potential safety concerns, off-label use of sedating antipsychotic agents and trazodone are typically weekly recommended against for the treatment of chronic insomnia in the absence of other health, mental health comorbidities. When indicated, the guidelines recommend short-term pharmacotherapy after a trial of CBTI or generally when an individual is unresponsive or unable to participate in CBTI due to accessibility or other barriers. ACP defines short-term as less than four to five weeks of treatment. Few guidelines address long-term pharmacotherapy, likely due to the lack of available long-term evidence. According to the guidelines that do address long-term use, the continued use of medications should be determined by individualized benefit-risk decisions and periodic reassessments. ACP suggests treating other potential causes of insomnia before deciding to continue pharmacotherapy beyond four to five weeks. After a trial of CBTI, if the decision to continue pharmacologic agents exceeds four to five weeks, ACP recommends that the treatment that the requirement for pharmacologic therapy should be evaluated at periodic intervals. The 2017 AASM guideline states that long-term treatment with benzodiazepine receptor agonists should be reserved for patients that are unresponsive or unable to use CBTI, have been screened for agent-specific contraindications, continue to show long-term benefit, and are evaluated on a regular basis. European guidelines suggest the need for long-term therapy may be based on a trial of discontinuing the pharmacologic agent and evaluating the response or switching to intermittent dosing for those taking benzodiazepine receptor agonists on a daily basis. We reviewed six systematic reviews focusing on the efficacy and or safety of melatonin for the treatment of insomnia in adults. These reviews found that generally melatonin improved insomnia symptoms compared to placebo, including among patients with comorbidities of schizophrenia and cancer. Concomitant melatonin use in people attempting discontinuation of benzodiazepines was associated with higher rates of partial or complete benzodiazepine cessation. None of the included systematic reviews reported head-to-head -head evidence of melatonin compared to any other FDA-approved therapies for the treatment of insomnia. Regarding safety, melatonin was generally well tolerated with very few adverse events, including among older adults. The most commonly reported adverse events were headache and sleepiness. 
there were very few reported serious adverse events. However, unlike for prescription products, manufacturers of dietary supplements are not required to submit proven efficacy, safety, or quality standards to the FDA prior to marketing. Thus, there is the potential for impurities in over-the-counter dietary supplements and concerns for accurate reporting of label-specified ingredients and amounts. Pharmacy utilization data for approved insomnia agents were extracted for the Utah Medicaid fee-for-service adult population from May 2021 through April 2022. To target benzodiazepine use for insomnia, pharmacy utilization data for benzodiazepines was limited to adults who had at least one insomnia-related ICD-10 diagnosis code within 30 days prior to the index benzodiazepine claim. Over the one-year period, the most utilized agent among the non-benzodiazepine hypnotics was zolpidem tartrate, followed by generic azoplacone. Among its zolpidem tartrate claims, 88% were for the immediate release formulation, and 12% were for the extended release formulation. Utilization was lowest for suvorexant, lumborexant, and doxepin, which are non-preferred on the PDL. Although we attempted to target utilization for ben of benzodiazepines for the treatment of insomnia, the utilization may also reflect use for other indications. The most utilized benzodiazepine with an FDA-approved indication for insomnia was temazepam 15 mg, followed by the 30 mg dosage. The prescription-grade melatonin agonist Rosarem, the brand of Remelteon, is currently preferred on the Utah Medicaid PDL. Remelteon is FDA-approved for sleep onset insomnia, thus coverage of over-the-counter melatonin may not be needed at this time since patients already have access without requiring a prior authorization to Remelteon. None of the included systematic reviews reported head-to-head -head evidence comparing Remelteon to melatonin, thus one agent cannot be recommended over another. Prozolpidem and xylopon, which are commonly utilized PDL preferred products, the board may consider recommending a point of sale edit that requires certain populations to initiate therapy at the lower end of the dosage range as recommended in product labeling. The board may consider recommending that a non-controlled substance for sleep maintenance insomnia be added as preferred on the PDL so that non-controlled substances are more easily accessible. Doxepin is the only non-controlled substance approved for sleep maintenance insomnia, but is currently non-preferred on the PDL. This concludes the presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Would you take the part, uh, from the early part of the presentation back up, please, for the summary information? Thank you. Sure. Let me know which chart um, you were referring to. I think it was um, was it this chart? I don't see that Dr. Siegfried is here with us today. Is that correct? Um, yes, Dr. Um, Winston, she, Dr. Shippey is not on today. Right. Um, well, it seems to me like the easy thing to do would be to um, incorporate the doxepin recommendation um, based on our, uh, based on the presentation and what, uh, what data we have and, and the, um, the incorporation in, in these guidelines. Um, 
and and so I think if we can do this in steps, because it seems to me the the other the other discussion that carries over from our previous meeting relates to melatonin, and that's a much more complex <laughs> issue um, uh, with the uh, with the uh, product issue. So um, if uh, if we're taking this in steps, I guess I would. Uh, suggest or or um, take off from the recommendation that we that we adjust the um, uh, adjust the process in whatever way th that needs to be done to get doxepin in there on the PDLs or um, make that make that available um, thank you dr. Winston so actually on the PDL right now the doxepine um, Tablet is a non refer in our hypnotic PDL class, but the formulation of capsule and concentrate doxepine is a refer product in um, in a different PDL class. So there is a access to the do to doxepine. It's just a different formulation. I see. So if, if there's anything that needs to be done, <laughs> or there isn't, um, I, I just want to make sure that we have that uh, accessibility. Um, and, and I think the other thing that we discussed at length, which um, uh, doesn't really show up here, is, is, the, is the widespread use of trazodone. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if we can uh, dispense with that conversation before, before we tackle the melatonin issue. Does anybody have uh, anything further they want to say about trazodone? Well, this is Dr. Siegfried. Can you hear me? Wonderful, yes. thank you. Uh, uh, with the doxepin, um, actually, uh, most providers uh, tend to use the generic form rather than the uh, lower dose uh, brand Silenor for insomnia, uh, just due to cost issues. Um, and in terms of trazodone, it has always been used off label. And I don't know if it is on the PDL as an antidepressant or not. Um, and doses do range there from, you know, 25 milligrams upward into the uh, antidepressant range, even for treating treatment of insomnia. And could I come in? Yes. I, I'm sorry. That is what I see sometimes um, with trazodone, you know, into 300 or even more sometimes. Um, so I don't know if this, uh, if we just leave that as a as an off label use or what? What do you what do you recommend about that? Dr. Sikri, if you are speaking, I think it's on mute. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, are you still um, online in terms of recommending or, I mean, I'm not really in favor of promoting off-label use of medications, uh, but if it is available as a, you know, antidepressant, I think you could just leave it as such um, because I know the board doesn't you know unless you want to put a PA and then just automatically approve them for off-label use of trazodone based on just you know community standard of treatment um, but the board doesn't usually like to promote off-use label of medications Perhaps you can clarify that for me. Is that the question for Dr. Hoffman? I apologize. 
I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? This, this had to do with whether or not we want to have uh, uh, trazodone remain as an antidepressant and then uh, it would be off label or how we, how we handle this since we know there is a community uh, use for uh, ins insomnia, but um, it, we don't promote that. So what, what's our status for trazodone uh, off label use and, and how, how do we want to handle that? If I captured that properly. I don't know if that I'm in the best position to answer that question. Um, our prior, um, I mean, what, Jen, can you speak to some specific processes around other medications and off-label use? I agree with Dr. Siegfried's yeah, comments. Certainly. certainly. So under, under our um, requirements, federal requirements, I mean, we know there are several products that, uh, um, okay, first of all, we have to follow FDA labeled indications, but there are compendia indications as well. So there are uses for products that are comp compendia recommendations and under federal statute, we are allowed to use pharmaceutical products um, in, al in, in uh, alignment with recommendations in compendia. So for example, um, I don't know that aspirin has ever received an FDA labeled indication for stroke prevention, for example. Um, and this is, of course, aligned with compendia uses. We know there is a body of literature that supports the use of aspirin for stroke prevention. So in that particular definition, we are allowed to use um, medicines for off-label use when compendia um, align with that. Okay, So those are sort of our, our federal requirements with regard to this. So um, we, could, we could look quickly. It looks like someone might be uh, looking up Compendia right now for Trazodone. Um, I don't know if someone's getting into Micromedics and, and checking that out. But regardless, we can have those discussions in, in under, under those that definition. It sounds like there were concerns expressed related to the dose range. That, yeah. You know, and, that should and, be defined in the compendia as well. Yeah, and there seems like there may be mechanisms to support yeah. more controls around that that could be considered. To, sorry, to adjust the status of the trazodone on the PDL right now, uh, the trazodone 50 milligram, 100 milligram, and 150 milligram is a preferred product with LPA on the PDL, and the trazodone 300 milligram is a non-referred that will require a, a PA if there's a need for that. And, and that's uh, solely as an antidepressant indication, correct? Correct, Dr. Winston. Any other question come in for uh, Dr. Lulo? So if not, I would. Oh, Kuma. Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking loud with all the discussion that perhaps we are not quite ready to take a stab at it. So, what's the rush? Why can't we uh, complete this exercise at the next meeting? And so we get little extra time and then try to come up with some, uh, you know, uh, off label versus, you know, what the narrative has to be or what requirements have to be or some guidelines attached to it. And then perhaps we can make a decision at the next meeting. Am I making sense? If you're referring to the trazodone, yes. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure there is something uh, that 
that we're asked to act on. I, I only I only brought it up because we were talking about that drug in relation to our uh, treatment of insomnia, and it and it isn't on our summary table because that medication doesn't appear in the guidelines. Various guidelines hasn't really been studied, but we know there's um, there we know there's a lot of off-label use. So I. I didn't mean to complicate the matter. <laughs> um, no, no, it's not that you are making it complicated. It is, it is that it is complicated. You know, I mean, you're not making it. That's the way it is. So, you know, perhaps some some kind of requirements or rationale that is required uh, to, you know, use it off label if if that's what we want to do. You know. Because it doesn't seem like we're, you know, agreeing with any course of course act course of action, you know. Thank you, Kuma. Uh, usually, when the product is on our PDL as a refer status. Uh, without any PA, it will normally going through the point of sale without any requirement, only if it's as a non-refer at the doses of 300 milligram trazodone at this point, um, it will require a, a non-refer PA, which is we do have some limited on that high dosage, but as a reg, as a lower regular dosage, um, right now we don't have any restriction toward that regarding the indication. Uh, here, here's a question though. When you get those, when you get those requests, and um, this this would have to do with the off-label use, um, do do prescribers put in the um, the alternate diagnosis? Is is there information there where we could sort um, the off-label use, or is that like everything else, kind of uh, hit and miss? <laughs> Uh, we do have when when the provider does request a uh, prior authorization for a non refer product, which in this case is a trazodone 300 milligram. Uh, we we do ask for a chart no that is having like a diagnosis and assessment of the patient, so we kind of understand what is the what is it used for. If it's for the off label that is or not compendia, then we would do outreach to the provider to to clarify on on the use of those medications. Now, I, I also overheard earlier on something about the cost. Is this very expensive? Uh, we usually don't discuss about the cost at the DUR meeting. I, but all I'm saying is I heard somebody mention earlier in the presentation the cost. So I'm just wondering. <laughs> Uh, Kumar, I was referring to the uh, brand name of the doxepin Silenor versus generic doxepin, which is not the, at the same dose and is much cheaper. And often providers will not use the brand name because of the cost and often just will use the generic, even though it's at a slightly higher dose than the brand name which is a uh, drug specifically, the brand name Silenor specifically for insomnia. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So to, for the decisions that we need to make today, um, thank you, advancing to what you want to put up there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank so yes, uh, for the next discussion we will have is regarding the melatonin coverage proposal. Um, this is the regarding to the discussion at last time for the insomnia insurance and in this for the adult. The Utah Medicaid pharmacy team proposed that we will cover the over-the-counter melatonin product, which meet the good manufacturing practice and quality which purity has been tested and certified or recommended by third-party laboratory USB and the consumer lab. And the over-the-counter melatonin product has to be prescribed by the provider through the point of sale system. Um, this is how we're gonna propose a coverage for the melatonin at the moment. Uh, through, regarding the 
utilization uh, for the last 10 years from 2012 to 2022, we only received so far 29 requests for the melatonin total. And um, by looking at other state at their PDL and the over-the-counter drug list, there is a total of 10 other state cover melatonin, um, which is the Oregon, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Massachusetts, Missouri, and uh, no, sorry, Nebraska, Ohio, and Vermont, and Wisconsin that are also cover uh, melatonin at the over-the-counter. Um, at the moment, we don't need the, I was like, we not require the, the vote from, from the board regarding the proposal, but is there any question regarding to, to the proposal? Is there an age restriction on that or no? Uh, at the moment, there is no restri restri uh, age restriction. This will be for both children and adult. Thank you. My only question has to do with uh, all of these um, the things we discussed today and education of our prescriber community. Um, I, I know this is an evolving uh, field and um, uh, we have uh, safety, patient safety uh, concerns. And uh, when, when you put up that summary uh, table of the guidelines, um, you can see, uh, you know, VA does not recommend benzodiazepines. I'm very familiar with um, the, the guidances that come from VA uh, since I spend a lot of my clinical time there. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that our, our prescribing community at large, you know, uh, would, not, would not know or patients would not have access, for example, to CBT or some of the non-pharmacologic strategies um, even though we're promoting them generally. Um, how, I guess it's always, you know, it's always my question here. Um, how, do we, how do we interact with our uh, prescribing community and how do we promote these um, um, good practices uh, aside from what, what you all do, you know, just the, just the excellent job in the, on the pharmacy side? What else can we do um, to get this kind of information out? That's for my edification, really. Thank you, Dr. Winstein. Um, we would usually before these go out. Can you have a, an answer to Dr. Winston's comment? No. Okay. Uh, we will try the, our best to um, communicate this coverage with the with the provider and in the community before this go live through our uh, Medicaid bulletin board and then our MIP and then like any other things. And in there, we will try the best to put on the recommendation for the guideline that trying the CPT um, and other first recommendation um, before the melatonin, especially in the adult population. Uh, any other comments or questions regarding the proposal? No, thank you. Uh, we can move on to the next agenda is the optomic corticosteroid intravitreal implant and injection. Uh, which is including Ilvin, Orzadec, Redisor, uh, tra the Tracian, and Sigpir, and Zutik. Um, at the last meeting, the board has made some recommendation on the word change and then the format. But after taking back this to the clinical team and we review it again, uh, with according to information at the prescribing information, we uh, the clinical team decide to keep the same format as each of these drugs have their very own uh, specific language on what is the indication and what is covered um, on these specific drugs. So we would like to bring it back to the board for information. So the criteria for the approval for all of these drugs is the implant or the injection is prescribed and administered by an ophthalmologist. The patient is at least 18 years of age or 12 years of age for registering. The patient doesn't have contraindicated 
condition of the request medication per prescribing information. Uh, specifically for Illovin, uh, the required diagnosis of the diabetic macular edema, and which is frequently treated with optimic corticosteroid without a clinical significant rise in intraocular pressure, and previously undergone at least one prior macular laser treatment. For Ozodec, the patient has to be diagnosed for diabetic macular edema or macular edema following the brain retinal vein occlusion or central retinal vein the CRVO. Uh, there's a typo, right, that we have to, or central retinal vein occlusion CRVO, um, or diagnosis of non-infectious uveitis affecting the posterior segment of the eye, which requiring the trial and failure of Humira for at least six weeks before the request of this medication. For Redisor, uh, requiring the diagnosis of non-infectious uveitis affecting the posterior segment of the eye, which also requiring the trial and failure of Humira in the last six weeks. Uh, for at least six weeks within the last year. Uh, for trisanes, we requiring the diagnosis of visual visualization during vitrectomy, sympathetic ophthalmia, temporal arthritis, uveitis, or ocular inflammation condition unresponsive to ophthalmic corticosteroid, uh, which we ask for the detail of the ophthalmic corticosteroid. For side year, we ask for the diagnosis of the treatment for the macular edema associated with the uveitis. And for UTIC, um, the diagnosis of chronic non-infectious uveitis affecting the posterior segment of the eye was also required to and failure of the Humira. The authorization is only one implant per approval, the infection number to be determined on the individual case review. The re would will be permitted for the opposite eye if the treatment of the first eye is successful. This is bring to the board um, as information. Any questions regarding the PA? I would move approval with your typo correction wherever you found it. Thank you. Lost that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, I, we don't, right at the moment, uh, we don't ha really have to have the motion on this for, on this uh, PA. Thank you, Dr. Winston. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to keep the process going. Oh, you're good. Thank you very much. Um, with that, that is all for our agenda today. The next meeting will be set for August 11. Um, for the review of the drafted 2022 CDC clinical practice guideline for the prescribing of opioid. Um, that would be all. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming to the meeting today. Have a good day. Thank you.